What's going on, YouTube? Welcome back to another Gamer Juice R Us episode. I'm joined today by <laughs> James Beck and Rosemary Kelly. How are you guys doing? I'm uh, great after that intro. I love it. It's going to be a spicy episode, that's for sure. <laughs> Energetic intro. I wonder what happened at this past event. <laughs> I don't know. Wolf, why don't you uh, tell okay, people? Okay, well, who can really be sure? You know, anything could happen. I got to tell you all that I started talking and I did not know what words were going to come out of my mouth. So, I, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, yeah, today, Beast Coast Pokemon, we're talking about Charlotte Regionals, largest number of entrants in any official VGC tournament ever, uh, and won by yours truly. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about it. Wolf is the best VGC player uh, in the entire world at this point. I mean... Uh, sorry, James. <laughs> You're up there as like a close second, but like honestly, it was like an incredible performance to watch. I was there with Aaron on the commentary side of things, and honestly, the entire tournament, it felt like we were watching just so many different and amazing teams that gave so much variety to what we were seeing. No, I thought this event was really awesome. Like, Charlotte was one of my favorite events last year, and it did not disappoint this year. The only little bit, I guess, was like the tech issues, but when you have such a large event i think you're just going to have some issues as the day went on i felt like they were solved quite fast so i was really happy about that but overall thought the event was really cool thought the matches were really great and yeah i've seen wolf you playing and just it kind of reminded me of spike Wolf. you were able to really show off i think your core which was like her shifu and cinema real boom with some of your own takes and i felt like it was a masterfully played tournament from you Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. I, I don't know what happened, but I feel like my, my play was really good this weekend, like way better than, than normal. So that was really exciting. Yeah, I thought the event was great. I mean, it's kind of interesting to compare it to Orlando from last year, where when tournaments get super big, they become just a lot harder to manage. For anyone who, does, who doesn't know, like the way Pokemon tournaments work is that for the vast majority of the tournament, we're playing a Swiss format. And the way that Swiss works is that everybody plays the number of rounds until elimination or like until the, there's cutoff. Uh, and what that means is that unlike a double elimination, bracket where people can kind of advance through at their own pace in a swiss format the tournament can't advance until every single match from the round is over and so the more matches you have the, the more likely it is that rounds will be held up and that a single issue a single you know disconnect can just delay things a lot so we, there was definitely a slow start at the beginning but yeah i think overall the the organizers did a great job uh in, in the running of the event something that i'm curious about by the way is about the diversity of the teams in the in the tournament because i feel like i played against a super wide variety of archetypes like on the first day alone i played nine different archetypes the maximum possible and i'm kind of curious from like your experience as a player and your experience as a caster rose if you had similar experiences or if things looked a little more centralized well maybe we start with this right because i think this goes goes back to what we expected to change in between Portland and Charlotte because Portland was the very first event that we had for regulation F and I feel like when you have the beginning of a regulation the doors kind of fly wide open when it comes down to what Pokemon are viable and what can you actually use in order to create a successful team and then we fast forward to Charlotte and I feel like that blew open even more I don't know if that was the experience that you had too James like what were you even trying to prepare for in between the two events yeah i think like when you have a tournament as big as this one where you have so many different competitors as well as like the basement in the meta right now it's just like it's early format so it's not super centralized we got to see a bit of a glimpse at portland but really it's just a lot that you can use in this format there's so many different bible archetypes i remember when i played euic one of the larger events of the season a lot of palafin balance was pretty much everywhere and i don't think i faced a single palafin balance team let alone even an arcanine throughout that event and i feel like this tournament our chaladon or caladon i don't know how you pronounce that pokemon's name and i faced three of them which i thought was like really? actually a lot yeah i faced three of the tailwind teams they were all quite different but like it just had that same composition of like our shifu our caladon and Tornado. so i thought that was like really unique but i think that just shows like everyone's tournament runs going to be very different especially in this kind of big tournament maybe more in day two where it's like a smaller field it's going to be more similar but overall like i think there were a lot of different compositions i heard my friends face as well and they had completely different runs than me yeah, that totally makes sense. I feel like the bigger the tournament, the more the higher the variance of matchups you can run into like during it. That part of my preparation for this event was I really wanted a team that was going to be strong against a wide swath of the format because my personal read on it, I wanted to make sure that like rather than having really really good matchups against kind of the strongest archetypes, that I instead had good to even matchups just kind of across the board without any really bad matchups. I, I think I got kind of lucky in that I played against a bunch of like different stuff in a sense where I always had tools uh, in every matchup, even if it wasn't easy all the time 
I think part of the reason, by the way, why we're seeing a lot of diversity is because sometimes it feels like a Pokemon is really good, like Palafin or Arcanine, right? But it also feels like certain types are really good, like Fire is a really big one, right? In the top eight alone, there was a Chiyu, a Hisuian Arcanine, an Entei, a Gouging Fire, an Incineroar, an Ogre Pond Hearth Flame. There might have even been one that I forgot. That's already six different Fire types represented in the top eight, you know? So I wonder if there are other kind of trends that we can see coming out of this event in terms of types. I think Grass is another one where there's a lot of good Grass types right now. Dark types was yeah. a pulse that I had my finger on in terms of coming into this event. In particular, you're really looking at some of the big archetypes that exploded in the online tournaments leading up to this event. I thought Blood Moon or Saluna would be really strong. And also, indeed, to be able to block the priority spam that we saw actually win the Portland Regional Championship. So I feel like those two things collided to kind of make the perfect storm for dark types being really, really good. Not only do you have a really positive matchup into something like the Ndidi, but Dark Urshifu completely like off the charts brought to a ton of different teams and also feels like a very splashable Pokemon in order to actually put it onto a team. Yeah. I, I do also think that overall, like we saw a lot change, I think, in between Portland and now. And I think that's just a big sense of like people trying out new different compositions. We saw a huge online tournament by Victory Road. And we saw a lot of the team compositions there do well that also did well at the Charlotte Regional Championship. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see like upcoming, like how uh, I believe Knoxville, I always get Knoxville and Fort Wayne mix, mixed up, but I'm pretty sure it is Knoxville. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty excited to see how that's going to form, especially with the Global Challenge as well, going to be the same weekend. So there should be a lot of different innovations I've been coming up. Yeah, it's definitely interesting that we live in an era where online tournaments have such a big impact on the game. I remember um, my friend Justin, him and his kind of friend group were bringing the Iron Crown and DD archetype to the tournament. And they were really upset because there was a ton of that popping up in the last the tournament the weekend before the event. They were like, we kept this under wraps like we didn't test this anywhere and all of a sudden there's you know everyone's using iron crown and dd so yeah i think it's it's cool because back in the day there weren't really there were nowhere near as many online tournaments as there are nowadays and so it's kind of cool to see those shape the the meta game i expected to play against a lot more blood moon or saluna Ferrigraph than i did especially given it was all over the top of the showdown ladder and obviously did well in, in the big tournament as well by victory road but i only played one team three three times from Nicholas. That was the only Blood Moon I played against, but I think it also is kind of the nature of, I really didn't play any against any one Pokemon all that often. I'm curious if that's going to change because I feel like when we take a look at where the meta is now, I would bet a lot of money that you're probably going to face a Fluttermane on a team. Like yeah. at least that's one Pokemon that I think will always be there. But I think what's really interesting about Fluttermane specifically is that it's built in so many different ways that you need to know a lot about that Pokemon in order to figure out how to beat it. Like it could be booster energy speed. It could be your calm mindset. That still boggles my mind. <laughs> um, but it could also be like Voice specs, your booster energy special attack. It could be focus sash. I've also seen that. But yeah, like just a couple of different ways that I think you will definitely need to prepare for that one. Yeah, speaking of usage stats, like we did have some of the usage stats of day two and Fluttermane still remains on top. It is one of the best Pokemon in basically generation nine history. And yeah, no surprise that it was used on the majority of day two teams. Some Pokemon that was kind of surprising to see kind of rise up compared to like the previous weeks and some Pokemon that did drop down. For instance, I think Dragonite usage went really down, I think, throughout this tournament. There were only, I believe, three in the day two if i'm not mistaken and that's pretty low i think especially after it did win the recent regional championship the highest one i think was top 16 by rogkov and then top 32 by riley and then some other pokemon that kind of out of nowhere a lot of top players end up using gouging fire and it was just a pick that you never really saw you saw a few maybe mess with it online but not really in tournament settings so it was really gouging fires i think shining moment here as well as the glamour tailwind offense we saw chi Yu kind of rise up which we never really saw much of Chiyu. Like, I think it was even dying down usage-wise in Regulation E, so it was kind of surprising to see a huge spike of Chiyu, I think, leading up to that Victor Road tournament and then at this regional. And of course, as you said, Wolf, the, the Iron Crown Entity usage, which I ended up bringing as well, uh, leading up to the event from the VR tournament. Like, there were a lot of them in that VR tournament and a lot of them actually in the day two. So it's just interesting to see like those different kinds of trends I think pop up. Yeah, I'm looking at the usage stats now. I, I'm looking at kind of the ones that they show on the stream, but something really interesting is that Chen Pao on day one was on 30% on teams as number three, the number three most used Pokemon. And on day two, it's not even in the top 12. So I feel like that's that's an enormous drop from Chen Pao. That actually might be one of the most steep drops from day one to day two we've seen 
ever. Slaughterman on day one was on 61% of teams. On day two, it rose to 68%. And also, interestingly enough, it looks actually to me like Urshifu is on about 64% of teams. So it's a little deceptive when you look at the usage stats because it's split by dark and water. Yeah, and actually Urshifu was single strike outperforming rapid strike for the first time since Scarlet and Violet, I think, released probably, which is really interesting. I think that's probably has to do with the drop of Iron Hands, who is probably the single best meta Pokemon against uh, Urshifu single strike because it's just so tanky and could heal off and hit for super effective damage and resist flick and blow. Okay, I have two Pokemon I want to get your thoughts on. Number one is Ferrigarath, who a lot of people were calling Ferrigar fraud coming into this event. Uh, I think a lot of people were like, oh, it's, you know, so bad, whatever. And the other is Incineroar, the previous king, who I, I saw a lot of discourse saying the king is is dead. The king, like, Hasui and Arcanine is the new king. So I'm, I'm curious what, what your take on it is. I mean, I know what my take is. I think these Pokemon are very good, but... I think they're really good. I had Furgraph on one of my watch lists also heading into this event, especially after the priority spam that Alex Underhill used to win Portland. I felt like you have to deal with it some way, whether it's through speed control, that doesn't really matter. Even if you have Tailwind up, you can just prio spam, use a sucker punch, use an extreme speed. All of a sudden your Tailwind doesn't matter anymore. But I raise you a Furgraph with Armor Tail that can shut all of that off, is super bulky. You slap a Citrus Berry on that thing, also not going to die to most things in the format if you double target it so you're almost guaranteed in those situations to get trick room up or reverse the trick room you also showed off the throat spray version because it does actually have a significant amount of special attack output so i think that for is definitely something that people will keep on their radar and i don't know if right now there feels like there is a reliable way to beat the for and i think that every team will struggle with it in some way shape or form based on how it's actually built on the other side yeah, I think between these two Pokemon, I think I'll start off with the King and Cineroar. Like, I think we all know about how strong this Pokemon is throughout its usage in ever since it got Intimidated in Gen 7. Intimidate plus Fake Out plus a pivoting move in either U-Turn or Parting Shot. Like, it just is able to fit on so many core compositions. The only reason I would say it's probably, like, less usage-wise is, one, there's a lot of ways to prevent Intimidate now. We have the Inner Focus. We also have the Clear Amulet item, which is also another big factor. But also, you do have a lot of Defying King Gambits as well. But overall, like, you can't really go wrong with it it's got great bulk it's able to go for parting shot to reduce even drudo's inner focus pokemon it's just such a solid mod for rigraph i think is a unique one where your take was a little bit different than the ones we've seen a lot of them we used to see were like the helping hand ones you actually ran a for rigraph that had protect as well as a way to boost up with the throat spray which i thought was a brilliant choice because you're able to go for some spread damage right away yours was actually decently invested if i'm not mistaken based on some of the roles that i've seen on stream and the fact that you could actually immediately threaten heavy damage, but also have that protect mind game as well, where if opponents want to use priority moves and try to get rid of Furugaf, they could be walking to protect, and then you could be pivoting into your fake out mod. You could be getting in or Shifu with Choice Scarf that can do a lot. And if they try to outspeed a Scarf or Shifu, you always threaten the Trick Room. So I thought it was like a really well designed team from your perspective. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think my team had a lot of things that I think were really strong. Uh, I had a lot of like speed control. I had a lot of priority moves, but I think one of the things that maybe isn't as obvious that you just called out is the synergy with fake out where I had two fake out users. And if you think about it, every Pokemon on the team could benefit by being paired with fake out. You had Urshavu who could hit through protect, Fluttermane with Calm Mind, Ogre Palm with Swords Dance, and then Frigoraph could set up with either Trick Room or Hyper Voice. And yeah, I basically realized that Frigoraph, I really like this Throat Spray set because although it's not nearly as bulky as the Citrus Berry set, for, for example, like, uh, uh, this is just very set often EVs to survive Terra Fire plus one uh, IV Cudgel from Ogre Pond Hearth Flame. And my Furigraph almost dies to Terra Fire non plus one uh, IV Cudgel, which is really funny. <laughs> like it's like basically 50% bulkier on the physical side than mine is. And I don't have Citrus Berry, so that damage tends to stick a lot more. Um, but the damage output is, is really, really nice. And I basically realized that by pairing Furigraph with two fake out users who are both, they have really high base power moves in Sonora and Rillaboom, you could buy time to set up with Trick Room and with Hyper Voice and then comboing like plus one Hyper Voice or plus one Psychic with a move like Flare Blitz or Wood Hammer. It's actually really hard for a lot of teams to deal with, um, especially with knockoff removing items like Citrus Berry from Incineroar and, and Assault Vest from Rillaboom as well. That's, that's the other real one, even if they Terra. So yeah, I feel like I was really able to make a lot of use out of fake out which I don't think a lot of people were really considering as that good with people. Like, obviously, Fake Out is good, but with Frigograph and Ndidi and just, in, like, Incinera being less valued in general and Inner Focus, that's a big one as well, and Terra Ghost, I feel like people were just not really respecting Fake Out as much as, as, in my opinion, should. And so I feel like my team was really able to take advantage of that.
I agree with that. And I think something else important that both of you bring up and why maybe people were looking at Incineroar and being like, he's dead, like, oh my god, is more that when Incineroar left its mark in Sword and Shield, it was one of the highest usage Pokemon and it felt like it was a, 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 like a necessity to put onto a team in order to actually find success. And I think people had that impression left in their minds when coming into Scarlet and Violet. And so when they see Incineroar, they're like, the king is back, of course. Like, how could we not love Incineroar? He's, he's here to stay and he's here to reign VGC. And I think when you look at how unsplashable that Pokemon ended up being and how much positional focus has to be paid attention to when actually utilizing the Pokemon, I think people realize it's really hard to use effectively. And especially with all of the problems that you mentioned, Wolf, it does feel like Incineroar is way harder to actually utilize in this meta. Um, but you also, I think, need to definitely take into consideration the knockoff, like you said, but Incineroar just got that and Helping Hand. And I feel like there's so much more to explore when it comes down to this Pokemon. Like, I actually feel like they buffed it and, they and did. uninherently did that. I don't know why they did that. They hate me. Why did they do personally? that? Personally, they kept parting <laughs> shot for Dynamax format and forgot to take it away. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> so true. All right, here's another thing, though, that I think is important that we look at, right? Outside of Ferrigaraf and Incineroar, that definitely feel like they're returning to form. Where'd Don Dozo go, huh? Don Dozo got second place at the Portland Regional Championships from Chup Across, and then it dropped off an actual cliff. There was zero Don Dozo in day two of Charlotte. Zero. Wait, really? No, there should have yeah, been. I think there, there was one. At I, least one. I, nope. I, nope, there is no Don Dozo. There Wait, was but, no Don Dozo, not a single one. Check the, check it, check the facts. Oh, because no I played. Wait, no, but I played a Don Dozo at at or at seven at seven oh. Where did where did he go? He lost. He <laughs> lost to you, and then he lost his last round too, or something. That, he should have been seven two, I think. That's no, cool. I, I mean, I believe you. I just I'm just shocked because I I definitely. Hang There's on, none. Yeah. Let me get my hand. Let me get my notebook. The highest right one was Connor, who finished six three. Yeah, he actually left, ladies and gentlemen. Wolf left to go get his notebook. <laughs> wait. Yeah, I played Connor. But he yeah, went, he, he went, finished six three and and went top 128. So you must have played him at six. Wait, when did I? I must have gotten my rounds confused. Hang on a second, Jervis, analyze. Yeah, it says here I played him round eight. Was I down? I must have been down paired. You were not down paired. I do remember yeah. that. Yeah, oh. you were down Oh, you were seven zero and you that. faced a six one. I actually do remember because I was okay. Paired, so. Thank thank goodness for you. Thank goodness you remember what I did, James, <laughs> because I I definitely do not. I, I I'm really surprised. I was like, how could you not? Oh, I feel so bad. Oh no, he was he was six he was six one. He gets up paired. Oh man, that's rough. Yeah. Yeah, this... Dondozo Dondozo died. Dondozo. <laughs> I, I think that Dondozo probably like I don't think it was ever really that strong to be honest, but I think that in the first re uh, sorry ever really that strong in Regulation F. Obviously, there are times where it was really strong. My my take is kind of that it's a really hard Pokemon to play against, and it's a really hard Pokemon to kind of understand what your tools are in team building. And so I think that Dendoza is a Pokemon that like in the first format of almost any format, barring maybe restricted Pokemon, it should always have a chance at least, just because it's it's like raw power is so high. But I, I it's not surprising to me as that as the teams get more optimized and get stronger, it has a harder and harder time. Also, Urshifu Dark and Urshifu Water both being relevant for the first time is probably not great because those are both Pokemon who can quit, quit through the boost and there's no type that resists both water and dark. So you'll be like, I guess you could have like Fairy Terry Dendozo, but then you could run into all the grass types. So I don't know. Yeah, it's, it seems tough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The problem with Dendozo, I feel like there's just like, I think a lot of cards against Dendozo, I think throughout this tournament, uh, even stuff like uh, there was a lot of Amoongus, uh, bulky Pokemon like Porygon 2. Porygon 2 actually had a mm. pretty good shine. Or Caladon, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Electro Shots. There's a lot of counters, I think, throughout it. Glamour also being a big one, being able to like wear down Dendozo with its ability. Yeah, not too surprising, I think, for the most part that Dendozo wasn't able to do that well in this event. Yeah, not even to mention Raging Bolt, right? Who not only has you know, like Terra Electric Thunderbolt probably hits so hard. And with Thunderclap, there's no real mind games with Dendoza, right? It's like, am I going to protect for forever? Especially the Rocky Helmet one where there's no like real benefit to protecting. Yeah. I don't know. There's there's a lot. Yeah. So I guess, but it is, it is, it is it's a great call out, Rose. Cause like, yeah, you would have, you would expect some Dendozo after a second place, but it feels like some old favorites definitely fell off pretty hard here with Dendozo and Chen Pao and Dragonite and a couple other Dragonite, Pokemon. there were three out of 75 teams. Dragonite? That's it. In day two, there were only three. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah. Wow, that's uh, Chen Pao not doing very well. Probably also hurts that a lot. 
Exactly. Um, yeah, that all makes sense. Well, I think we're, we're getting close to wrapping up here. So I guess my question for y'all is, did you have a favorite moment or a favorite team or like any, any standout highlights from Charlotte Regionals? I'll go first. How about that? I'll go first. <laughs> standout team? Yeah, baby! <laughs> it's me! Uh, that, that's, that's mine. Um, I played against a lot of really cool teams, though. Um, I thought Nicholas's team in the finals was and round nine and round 12 uh was all was all it's a cool team because it has both tailwind elements and trigger moments with blood moon so i thought that was really neat um my favorite moment i am biased here but there was a turn where i was playing against luca in the semifinals, and turn one went very badly where like i was predicting i was worried about like flutter main switching in and and i had urge people in the field for the king gambit so i went for u-turn and he just stayed in and I had to basically give up either Incineroar or take a ton of damage on both Rigoreth and Rillaboom. So I went Incineroar, gave it the boost and sacked Rillaboom. And then I was like, okay, well, this has gone very badly. I think I need to make a prediction here or else I'm just like toast. So I went for a parting shot into the King Gambit, which is a very risky thing to do. And it, it paid off. And I was just very, very happy that I was able to like not only make that kind of play and get it right, but also identify that I probably needed to make a really aggressive prediction in that spot to come back into it. Um, but yeah, like sitting there and being like, am I really going to parting shot this King Gambit? And like, not only if I get it wrong, not only immediately lose the game, but just look like the dumbest person to ever play Pokemon. Um, and so the fact that it paid off, I was really, I was like grateful for. <laughs> I casted that match. Yeah. Uh, I remember looking at that and I looked at Aaron and I went, I have no words. Help. <laughs> what do I do here? <laughs> How do I respond or react to this? Because uh, <laughs> this is going to go one of two ways. Uh, and I really hope it's not downhill. <laughs> Charlotte was by far maybe one of the best casting experiences that I've had in like in just over the, the generation of years. And so I'm just like, I'm happy because like it wasn't even just your matches, Wolf, right? We had so many amazing games on stream. Like I remember the end of Steve and Mia versus Arbin Tumanang's match for, for top eight. And I remember at the final moments of that, I lost my mind because there's so many RNG moments that happen on that particular game. And you kind of just... You don't hope for bad luck to happen to a player, but it makes for some really exciting moments to cast over. So I I do feel bad that Steven was on the receiving end of that, but also I think the viewers got a great experience. So rough. Yeah. <laughs> I think team-wise, my favorites, uh, it's kind of like tied, I think, in a way. I really, really respected how, like, you were able to bring out the most, I think, of like a really standard like Urshifu and Sinnoh real boom. But the way I think I like was watching you play, it was like, oh man, the pressure that Wolf is creating with the rotations is absolutely incredible. I think the other one I would say would probably be Luca's team because yeah, I also really cool like the idea of the gouging fire. But I think it's funny because he told me like he only brought gouging fire like once in that day too, and that was against you, ironically. Oh. So I thought it was <laughs> yeah. really funny that way. But uh, yeah, like overall, I would say those would probably be my two favorite teams. I would say, although shout outs to like some of the guys who ended up running some of the more unique stuff, for instance, there's a Hisuian Zorak that made day two. Apparently, there was a dual screens Adarine. Uh, hard trick room but no indie d uh zach Thornburg, <laughs> and then like there were a few others like a lot of p2 teams i thought brendan's call of iron jugglers was super unique especially against Agreed. like all the size spams so i thought huh. that team was really cool the articuno magmar team that made day two by i Don was actually Jex just was, about to point that out one. yeah that one was incredible so i thought there was like really cool innovations overall then i would say favorite moment I don't know. I would say the one from the tournament specifically, I would say like watching Nicholas come back against you in that game too, when I thought like it was that pretty was unwinnable from that game or that turn one was absolutely bonkers. Like I, I was like, after I saw the tournament, I'm like, okay, Wolf's got this. Like uh, he's a closer. <laughs> and then Nicholas comes back and I'm like, wait, he lost? Yeah. And, and then... That was my thought too. I was like, huh? I lost? <laughs> And then I guess like outside of the tournament, the karaoke we did late at night into uh, my friends apparently getting us lost and uh, Ubering us to a random residential district area at 3 a.m. in the morning. That one was like a ride. Let me just say this tournament has been one of the strangest outside of tournament experiences I've ever had in general throughout like the three days. But overall, just really fun time. 
This sounds That's like really a story funny. we need to hear more about at some point, James. Because, like, <laughs> I need more details after Every you time... just teasing us with that. Yeah, James, I feel like you have so many interesting stories. And you always just pop in, like, little, like, like little, like, crumbs. You're like, oh, yes, I did this very interesting thing. And, like, maybe I'll tell you about it. Maybe I won't. Like, um, with your, I, I always remember when you just told us casually that you had to walk, like, a mile to school with your trump was it trombone am i remembering it, it this was correctly? a tenor sax <laughs> yeah i was it was just like casual like <laughs> i mean i can also tell you about the disappearing shoes that i had they disappeared from my hotel room like so on the <gasps> tournament day i had to wear slippers yes they, <laughs> me and my friend spent 20 minutes looking in the hotel room looking for my shoes they disappeared so like oh i have to wear slippers which kind of sucked because Actually, it was kind of weird because it was kind of beneficial. I had a really bad pain in my left foot that affected me throughout this event. So, like, it kind of helped because it wasn't so bad. But while walking outside, it was actually, like, really bad. So It was cold, uh, too. I bet your so feet were freezing. I had socks. I had socks okay. on. So it wasn't, like, awful. But, like, yeah, it was uh, not a fun day for my foot. I'll just say that much. Disappearing shoes. <laughs> this man lost his shoes. We did find them. We did find them. Where were they? Oh, man. We uh, so I searched underneath my bed, like when we were searching the initial and I'm like, OK, it's a wooden frame, you know, like how wooden frames are like underneath the bed. So like nothing yeah. can really go inside. I'm like, OK, they're not here. <laughs> then like Sunday, I wake up late. I'm like, OK, cool. I trip. And then underneath uh, my uh, uh, the other bed, my shoes are underneath like some cover. <laughs> and then the also like underneath the wooden frame, like it's like squeezed under there. I'm like, huh. OK, then. So I found my shoes that way. <laughs> that is wild. Well, I'm glad, glad you found your shoes. Glad you didn't have to take the slippers on the airplane. Um, I think that's all the time we have. So we're going to wrap up here. Um, but yeah, th thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you enjoyed the content, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe. And uh, if you had any favorite from, uh, moments from Charlotte, make sure to comment them down below. But yeah, from all of us at East Coast Pokemon, uh, thanks for watching and hope to see you again soon.